Okay, thank you very much for the for the invitation. First thing I, I would like to thank uh, Alfonso Miranda, Professor Alfonso Miranda, Professor Oscar Sirovia, for the kind invitation to be here today. Just to talk some words, some problems, some solutions perhaps about the problem of longitudinal data and surveys and the data for substance. So first of all, the index. First, I want to present some ideas about the way from surveys to big data. Some big questions about the, the big data problem. I have more questions than answers, I'm sorry. <laughs> and I have a lot of questions about uh, all these problems. Uh, some statistics, ideas about uh, how statisticians uh, face or focus these, these kind of problems. Some words about computer science and some ideas and examples of uh, big data. The first thing I, I want to show you is my way, my way to be who I am today. And who I am today, who am I? Well, some people has, has told me that I'm a data scientist. So, uh, since uh, data scientists are not so common as industry would like, then I think it would be a good idea to show you the, my role, my, my, my own career. I began in statistics. In the 90s, working especially with medicine, so statistics in medicine. <coughs> so uh, I, I, I was a biostatistic, a biostatistics statistician, so biostatistician. But after that, uh, I began to work with pattern recognition, especially in the area of combining information, combining different sources of information for pattern recognition. Uh, in the area and subject of support vector machines. We used to combine uh, kernels uh, to improve classification tasks. Uh, in the same years, people began to say that uh, not about the recognition anymore, it's the name is data mining. Okay, data mining, mm -hmm. as you prefer. And after that, I began to work with uh, a computer science department. So, since two years to today, more or less, people uh, is saying to me that I'm a computer, no, sorry, that I'm a pattern recognition researcher working in a computer science environment using statistics. So, you are a data scientist. Okay, you say that. But I'm, I'm all my life doing more or less the same thing, analyzing data using computer science to do it proper way, using the proper machine learning techniques and trying to show you results as better as you can, which is called now visualization, okay, visualization. And after that, if possible, you try to publish your, your research in a, as good as you can, paper or meeting or whatever. But today I'm a data scientist, okay? You say that. And if you have a look to my, my publication, which I, I think it's a good reflex of what uh, data scientists would expect. Most, most of my publication are on computer science subject, computer science, science area, engineering, mathematics. And after that, you can see more or less one of over five of my publications are on medicine. Medicine, social sciences, chemistry, pharmacology, things like that. Is the, the domain or the application domain of my, of my techniques. Well, I, I, I would like to show this publication to you today because it's, in fact, it's my very first publication. I'm sorry because it's in Spanish, uh, but it's, it, it's about gastrointestinal bleeding uh, and it sets survival analysis. So the source we use. It was a Spanish drug surveillance system database called FEDRA. Uh, doctors are supposed to communicate uh, adverse, re adverse reactions to, to drugs. But in fact, the, 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 the real thing is that the, the, a low notification rate. So in this case, we, we use a, a very low sample size, you can see. It's the number of, of, of adverse reactions 
to these uh, drugs related to, that, to gastrointestinal bleeding. We use this crucial body test to compare different survival groups. And in these years, I understand the difference between a uh, statistically significant result because we, we found this statistically significant difference between what was found between aspirin and piroxicam groups. But my boss, uh, and years ago, told me, no, no, no. The practical thing is that this result is not relevant, not important. And I said, no, but it's statistically significant. He said, okay, but it's irrelevant for me as a doctor. And I said, wow, statistics has no sense. <laughs> <laughs> okay. After that, I, I collaborated in another paper uh, about uh, open heart surgery, open, open heart surgery mortality. In this case, the aim was to develop a risk stratification model to, to evaluate open heart surgery mortality in, in a region in Spain, in Catalonia. Um, well, in fact, the dependent uh, variable was uh, vertical mortality, and the, the total sample was uh, more or less 1,100 procedures in different hospitals, and the overall fluid mortality rate was 10%. We use logistic regression to analyze the, the different variables in order to look for the most significant ones. And in this case, I propose to change the classical loss ratio to consider the, the loss ratio associated to these different risk factors. And we generate uh, different, different scores, this score associated with these uh, variables. So, uh, the highest the, the loss ratio, the highest the, the weight in the score. And here in this figure you can see the results. We divided our score risk level in five uh, ages, in five uh, levels. And in this case, uh, there, there are a, a high percentage of the population of the, of the subject with low uh, risk level. And in this case, the mortality was uh, very low, 4%. And uh, we obtained very low people in the extremely high risk level with a very high uh, mortality. <coughs> okay, these are the, the past. No? What about the future, the challenges, challenge of longitudinal big data studies? Well, for me, from my point of view, this is, these are the main challenges of longitudinal big data studies. Regular sampling, high dimensional data, phase data, noise, for you have more noise, you have big data, and balanced groups, feature selection, which is crucial, especially in this type of studies. Several is, uh, I mean, it's always crucial, uh, the selection of the proper features. But in this case, when you have a data problem, you have many, many features in general, and you, it's mandatory to, to select the proper ones. Scarce data, missing data, and privacy. I know privacy is not the same all around the world, but especially in Europe, privacy is, is a problem when you are speaking about longitudinal data. Okay, some big questions about, um, about big data. Questions for, from the computer science point of view and questions from the statistical point of view. The questions are the same, more or less. Do we have the tools from a computer science point of view to face the focus on these uh, data problems? And from a statistical point of view, do we have the, the skills or not? I think probably not. Probably we don't have the tools yet. And I think probably we don't have probably the statistical skills. Probably not. Probably not means, from my point of view, that perhaps yes, but I think not. It's an opinion. Computer scientists are working on new tools. That's true. But statisticians, 
in general are confident throughout all tools. And on the other side, statisticians are working on new skills. But computer scientists are confident about all skills. So tell me what you need. You need data scientists that should know all tools and skills and should work on new tools and skills. But this is more, this is, as I think this picture has two years. It's a picture from 2013. But anyway, this is the landscape, the big data landscape. And it's crazy. There are too many options, too much options. There are a lot of noise here. You need an expert to guide you in this picture, to select. What to select? I have a big data problem. And now, Wow. Forget, forget. There is no one silver bullet. So you need an expert. Well, some questions, some statistics. Questions, questions from the point of view of a statistician like me. How big is big? I think it's a big, a good question. How big is big for longitudinal data? Well, I want you to show. I want to show you one of our real drones today at my university. I think I have forget to say that my university is University Rey Juan Carlos in Madrid, Spain. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> sorry. What? What is our population in this problem? Our population are the Wikipedians, that is the editors of the Wikipedia, or the stake exchange people, or collaborators, and you have a, a huge number of. of Wikipedia's, like three million, so row and row. The questions, our questions are to study the time until you, a user, a Wikipedian, Wikipedian user quits, or time until a question, so in this question and answer web pages like stack exchange. And the method to compare tools or to analyze this type, this kind of data is the same. That I showed before. Survival analysis, a cost model. It's, it's the same method. But the problem is that with such a huge population size, the estimated sample size to find out relevant significance, relevant, relevant significance is huge. Especially when the study focuses on a small, a very small population proportion. As an example, I want to show you this calculation. For instance, if the population proportion is 1 in 10,000, in order to detect a significant and relative risk of 1.1 with a power, a classical power, a classical type 1 euro, the need number of events is almost 9 minutes. So, it's a bit crazy. Because, well, why? Well, because the standard errors are inversely, inversely related to sample size, as you know, and a large sample size greatly increases the power of an analysis to detect a difference. So, but here another problem. Huge samples can make the significant significant. Because some sample has an effect on two values. <laughs> so as an example, no very clear here, sorry, but the conclusion is also an extremely large sample may provide sufficient power to conclude there is a statistic statistically significant difference between, for example, two means, the difference itself may not have any practical significance. Okay. So you have, you, you have here an interesting problem from the point of view of a statistician, because the idea is uh, the sample size has higher, has bigger, better. But it's not true. Not always. For instance, how to solve this problem? Well, some people is working actually on this type of problems. This is a paper 2015 this year. Analysis of sampling algorithms for Twitter. So to develop new statistical metrics to quantify the statistically representativeness of the tweets. In this paper, the authors develop new metrics 
and develop or develop sufficient conditions on the number of samples needed to obtain highly representative heat samples. And the great idea in the sample method do not depend on the total number of tweets. Or another good idea, I think, is to change your statistical mind. Me or a statistician in general are common with questions like what size difference do I want to be able to detect? But perhaps with such a huge number of people or subjects, the good question should be what size difference do I not want to be able to detect? Or how small of a difference would not be practical significant? And therefore, what should the upper limit of my sample size be to guarantee that I will not, not find such a difference to be significant? This is a change, a very heavy change for a statistician. But you can, as new ideas, to develop new metrics to assess the performance of your sourcing websites. This paper by one of my colleagues, Felipe Ortega, the university, well, analyze uh, these websites, the question and answer websites. And he, use, uh, he uses a survival analysis to model the time to answer questions. And well, in fact, uh, the authors develop new methods for longitudinal data analysis. But you can use all ideas for these new problems. This is a paper I published in 2002 with other my collaborator at the, at the University of Barcelona. Uh, using this type of sampling, inverse sampling, or sequential methods. In this case, we show how the calculated sample size for any classical design depends on the parameter parametrization you use. And in fact, uh, using the proper parameter parametrization and using inverse samplings and triangular sequential design to reduce the sample size needed in 20% or even in 40%. But you can use these new methods all ideas about new methods, disassemble methods, these statistical learning algorithms that construct a set of classifiers and then classify new data by taking a vote of their prediction. This bagging, boosting, sampling. And this is a paper by Michael Jordan and collaborators, the big data boost. It's a paper last year, I think. And this paper, I think, established many conceptual challenges in big data analysis. Just to ask if a new area in theoretical computer science is open or a new, even a new area in statistics. Well, in this section in computer science, I want to show this Spark model. I don't know if you are familiar with Spark, but these are very popular these days in the computer science uh, area, especially for big data. Spark model is a fast general engine for large-scale data processing. The idea is a uh, party on a cross-cluster the data and to store the data in memory, not in disks, but in memory. The Spark is well suited for to deal with machine learning algorithms. Well, I have some not news here, present news from, I, from IBM, uh, from a meeting with IBM and, and Apache Spark, the start of something big in data and design. Well, for me, the important sentence is here IBM has said that. Apache, sorry, Apache Spark yeah, should be the operating, the operating system for the analytics. Well, in, in, in Spain, we, we, 
we have we have actually a master in data science at my university and it's the first and unique 10 percent spark master in Europe. Well, I have here a case, uh, a use case for, for Spark. I think it's better to show another another examples later. Well, big data. What is big data? It's a recent term introduced in 2008 that refers not only to the data, but to the techniques to capture, process, analyze, and visualize potentially large data sets in a reasonable time frame. So for me, in the past it was a way a road from data to knowledge, but now with such a huge um, problem, a huge number of, of uh, data, you have a, a way from data to information to start the, the relevant information. Another way from information to knowledge, and another way from knowledge to intelligence. Well, I, perhaps you know this, this figure. It's a high cycle for emerging technologies. Two years old. Anyway, you have had to be data. Data is in the, in the peak of the, of the emerging technologies. And it's expected to be in the plateau of productivity in five, ten years, more or less. As well. IBM needs more than 1 million engineers and data scientists. He said in May this year. A data scientist is considered the sexiest job of the 21th century. I don't know. So to, to fill this gap, you need data science education. Of course, you need to educate people in data science. And well, there are another solutions like combination of information from several uh, data analysts or data science. This idea is the idea behind cloud sourcing for data analytics by the Kyoto University, especially the works at the Kyoto University, to combine the solutions of several experts to improve uh, the single solutions. What are the elements of data science? Well, I think these are the main elements. Data precision and recording, data preparation, extraction, cleaning, which is crucial. Clean properly your data, notation, and storage. Data integration, aggregation, and representation. Just to select the proper features. Crucial. Data analysis and modeling, and data visualization to show better as you can your product and if possible data products you need a product perhaps you don't need a product but you need it it should be the, the last step what about the scale well i think it's funny because I, I, perhaps you have never listened this before Jotabyte. Jotabyte is 10 to 24 bytes. It's crazy, anyway. Or my flight from Madrid to here has generated 30 terabytes of data, which is a lot of data from one single byte. One byte, eight bits to jettabyte. And the projected size of the digital universe in 2000, no, in 2020 is 44 thettabytes. A thettabyte is 10 to 21 bytes. Crazy. What about the data, the big data projects, especially in Europe? Well, in Europe, we have this core, this, this community research and develop information service. And the information there is that we have uh, the, the, the European Union funded uh, 1,000, sorry, 
142 big data projects. In different application domains, as you can see, government, ecology, social security, medicine, social networks, road traffic, etc. And I wanted to show you some examples of this big data. Let me choose the example. This is, I think, the, one of the, of the last samples of big data in Spain. And it comes from the Spanish General Direction of Traffic. I think I have the, the real thing here. So I want to show you. I think it's here. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it should be here. Yeah, it's here. Uh, the Spanish people have reset this, uh, this folder. Just to collect information, the, the, the name is uh, General Direction of Traffic 3.0 towards smart mobility. And the aim is to take advantage of new technologies to achieve the objective vision zero, zero death, zero injury, zero congestion, zero emissions. And the method is to develop a multidirectional information digital platform to collect information from drivers, cyclists, pedestrians, bikers, everybody, and to generate applications that generate useful information for these drivers, pedestrians, etc. Okay. Well, this is another example of, of this uh, big data, longitudinal data, the analysis of strategic well-being on Twitter by Geotech Mexico. Yeah, you know more than me probably about this, this uh, project. This is another tool for tweet sentiment visualization by the North Carolina State University. And I think this to show that uh, it doesn't work. It's difficult to, to visualize with sentiment. Quite difficult. You, you can try this, this tool because, uh, well, it's not very clear, but in the image, you can see the tweets uh, related to the, to, the, to the word Paris a week ago, four days ago, five days ago. And this is the happy thing. And over there is the sad thing. It's not, you cannot detect the real thing. Looking at the, the sentiment related to that tweets. It should be very clear that it is. You can see the, net, uh, the words related to the tweets. And of course, you can see words like uh, terrorist or attack, things like that. But the sentiment related to the tweets is not, is not clear. Anyway, I suppose you know this, but in a year ago, Twitter invested 10 million in the creation of a special laboratory, meat laboratory, that will be used to analyze the way people use social media. I like this initiative very much because, because the number of millions, of course, because, uh, because the questions, no questions, no questions from Twitter to meet. Ten million, no questions. Work. It's difficult. It's difficult to extract information from all the tweets. But it's a good uh, aim, I think, to better understand how particular thing, kinds of messages travel and spread through social media platforms. Uh, okay, we have results here. Good results, I think. From Doha, from Qatar, but the, the, you have a look to the, to the title: Twitter data mining reveals the origins of support for Islamic State. Analyzing the pre-Islamic State tweets of people who ended who end up baking the organization, you can see a trend. You can see the, the if this trend, you can detect. The SAT time, more or less, in which the, these people 
radicals and change their mind and travel to Iraq or Syria or whatever to fight against who knows. Okay, so analyzing the Twitter data mining, you can reverse this, this uh, you can prevent the theory, the, the, this support for Islamic State or whatever. And this is, I think, the last example I have for you. This is outsourcing human intelligence attacks. Just to combine, the idea is to combine the, the opinion or the, the results, right? the results, in fact, of several studies to improve the classification tax or, or to minimize the error. And these people from the university in Kyoto show that combining information, just from sourcing data analytics, The prediction performance of the winner significantly outperformed uh, the state of the army and the But the important result here is that the aggregating model of the black one uh, was started using a combination technique of the different the other models. You can see the, the aggregating model improved the final performance. And in fact, the good uh, news is that the performance of the aggregated model built only on from early submissions overtook the final performance of the win. So, as a summary of my, my talk, I think the idea is in this field. This is the big data solution I propose. And if you want words for this image, my words for the image is don't be panic. Work together. Thank you very much. Thank you. We will start with a very interesting uh, talk and very interesting talk. Uh, we have some time for questions. So, anyway. to understand all of everything that you say, but what is very clear is that uh, there is a huge production of information without paying a single penny for that. And in some way, social behavior and many of political behavior, environmental issues are there. And we need to develop what do you do even understanding of social dynamics of the behavior towards the least. How realistic do you think would be for this generation of scientists to be able to take advantage of this huge amount of data that is in now, yeah. you know, even, I, I, I even have problems to, to think about where is the storage of this information, but from your experience, mm -hmm. uh, we, we work, we are instructors, we researchers, we have students preparing them for the future, but how realistic would be the thing is that we are training them for this, because this is the future. Yeah, from the point of view of, of a statistician like me, <laughs> I think it's not realistic to, to prepare people only in statistics, for example. It has no sense. Because, as you said, even the data are not the story. You don't store your data. You receive your data by streaming. You don't need to store the data. For example, sometimes it's better not to store the data. So, in the past, as a statistician, I store my data on my hard disk, I feel great, analyze my data here, everything is here. But 
the future is, is not like that, no, no anymore. So I think you need to prepare your statistics, statistics but learning computer science as well, computer science tools, like as a Spark, for example, this um, distributed, uh, distrib distributed machine, this cloud computing thing. But of course, we need education, we need uh, more education in data science. My answer. I don't know if. Thank you very much. I one. More um, one. First one is uh, the first time I got into contact with big data and all this analysis. I thought as a statistician, with computations, and I am. I, I was thinking, well, this is not representative of any sample. You know. Yeah. How you know? Not from the point of view of a computer science. But from the point of view of social science, how we go around with the fact that this data will not or not yet ever give us a representative sample. And, and we, we really want to do hypothesis testing. We really want to learn the characteristics of the population. I don't really care about what the Twitters think. No, I, I care about the population. So I, I think that's a big question for big data. No? Um, I think you touch it, but I would like you to, or provoking you to, um, to discuss more that, about that. Second question is, um, following with the first question is, at the moment um, we have, the, so it seems the future we have the use of these big data and these new sources of data for doing social research. But the problem is that, or at least the problem that I see, is that we have engin engineers who knows how to crunch the data. And then we have social scientists, and we just can't talk, you know. So we need a new kind of degrees, a new kind of university has to start doing something because we can, at the moment, we cannot even talk. How do we go around that? Okay, the second question. If you have a look to my first, for example, to my first publication, I, I'm over there. And the first person was a doctor, and the second was a pharmacologist, and the third was a team, etc., etc. I think that, and here in my another contribution, this is a, a, a the person who, who in fact, open hurt. <laughs> You know, um, and the surgery. So I think that should be the solution to collaborate. Try to to talk to the statistician or to the computer science. Try to to, to get these people into your problem, your real problem, your real thing. And from for them it's the same. You cannot be a good computer scientist if you don't understand the problem. The first thing I, I did when I began to work with doctors was to take a course of statistics for medicine, for doctors, just to try to understand how you, doctor, understand statistics. It sounds crazy because I, I was a statistician. Perhaps you think you, you don't need that course should be very easy for you, yes, in fact it was very easy for me, but I learned a lot, a lot of things, because I changed my mind from my statistician point of view to the medical point of view, and after that I was able to understand, understood many things. I think that's the way, that should be the way. And Perhaps the solution is okay, began to, to study what you want, but at the end, probably you will need more. You can study computer science, okay, but are you going to work with doctors or with social science people? You need to learn uh, to understand these people. 
And sorry, the other question, I think it's related. <laughs> yeah, it was about the representative. Oh, yeah, the representative, yeah. Yeah, the representative. Yeah, the problem there is the, the huge amount of data. You should be careful with the question. And you should be, uh, I mean, you can detect many noise in this in this big data big data in general there are a lot of noise so to choose the proper population of the problem no but i have access to everyone to a lot of data uh, i cannot forget the question but, but i don't know i mean I, I should be careful with the question with the hypothesis i would like to test because your mind is, 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 is mind thinking in in, lo, in, in no, no big data thinking in i don't know a sample of a thousand or things like that 100 and you should be careful because you probably you to you will get access to more 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 and more data so. thank you very much uh, we have time for a more question one more question yes uh, we have uh, Julieta. Uh, you know, oh, you. <laughs> so, um, <clears throat> you know, when, when I when I see or when I hear about, I have sort of a similar reaction uh, that you heard, and I'm a, I'm actually an epidemiologist. And uh, when I hear about big data, I have a similar reaction of, okay, there is this uh, great amount of data, we have it there, let's just find how we're going to, you know, bring it into what we do, rather than from the other perspective of what are the questions that we need, and then looking out for tools to solve those questions. So, um, again, uh, I'm trying to see how is is it possible using this data? I'm going to step back. Um, we are more and more interested in contextual exposures. So, in how uh, the environments in which we live affect you know, uh, our, for instance, medical outcomes, uh, if the built environment around us or the the feeling of insecurity, for instance. Uh, health outcomes. How can you tie you know, this information and bring it into geographic or tie geographically? Is it possible to bring it in tie geographically in order to define you know social environments into in which people live, and then bring it in also as an additional um, sort of contextual exposure? So uh, the concern is that. Even if it's very data rich, you would require, if, if you were to understand, for instance, the, the social context of, geographical context of where this building is built, you would need to have Twitter users that define that area. So uh, I, my, I guess where I'm going to is that in order to tie it down, you require that geographical spread that may not be there. So, I guess I never asked the question. <laughs> <laughs> which, which, which brings back the idea that we are really appalled by all what, what all these means. I don't know, can you comment on tying it to geographical data? Yeah. Well, oh. if I understand, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry, but the point is that you want to geographical data and to understand it, geographical data uh, implies a, a new value for your data and of course it's, it's, it's crucial we have uh, a lot of with a big amount of data and with geographical uh, variables no? and it should I mean for me it sounds stupid not to use this geographical information the analysis do have, but it depends, of course, the, the, the problem. But we can talk later <laughs> if you prefer. 
Okay, um, so unless uh, there is another burning question, uh, then I will thank uh, Isaac. Uh, uh, we should take. Uh,